this place was really known for uh, for that. And from the second story windows in the missionary houses, you could see students getting out at uh, Oahu College, uh, Punahou now. Um, in 1848 is when Metcalf made his incredible map of the area, surveyed it. After uh, the Minister of the Interior, I forgot to mention this, uh, started asking people if they wanted to apply for lots along Kula O Kahua. Uh, and he made this map, and as you see, Thomas Square is right here. Thomas Square used to be thinner than it is now. And in 1850, uh, January 22nd, the Privy Council uh, mentioned that the this place, a day should be made out uh, for them to go out to Thomas Square, mark out its boundaries, and for it to be called by the name of Admiral Thomas. In March 8, 1850, they decided to reserve the lots and extend out Thomas Square to what it is now, up to this street. So that, that was wonderful to see the, the, the actual uh, deed, as it were. So this was always Crown Lands. It was never resold. So you're standing, they've never uh, built really anything on this area, uh, you know, or sold it or traded it. In going to the agricultural period of Thomas Square, uh, in 1873, they sowed oats and kiabe trees here. And in 1875, A.S. Claycorn uh, becomes charged with caretakership of this park. It becomes the Kingdom of Hawaii's first park. Uh, and along with uh, Queen Emma Square. It's, it, he piped in water at great expense uh, from downtown, I'm told. In 1879, I'm told, there was a 400,000 uh, gallon Makiki Reservoir that really started giving you know, water to this whole area. Grapes were sold in downtown stores. It, it, was, it was moving that way. Um, in 1876, uh, Mr. Mr. C. C. Coleman, a machinist and a blacksmith, was engaged to grow jute here with prison labor and a modest sum of uh, of, of water. Um, and then A. S. Claycorn went about on this grand scheme to build a park here with Robert. Wilcox designing this. He made this beautiful park with circles and semicircles. He, he wished to put in royal pumps surrounding the square and a uh, fenced-in area right here with, with a government nursery engaged by Mr. Jager. He sent for durian and mangosturum. He, they wanted to have valuable fruit trees and grow things. There was a great deficit about... They couldn't spend any more money. What did he do? He was urged and edged on by his friends to, to actually go on with the project. And he raised money from them, and they put a bandstand here. And they put uh, 34 seats, 10 rods of iron from England, as well as he planted crotons around the bandstand, and valuable trees and shrubs around here. The most beautiful part that we know today is the part uh, where he brought in ban uh, cuttings from his banyans in Ainahawa State in Waikiki. And he planted them here, and they are here till this day, Kaiolani uh, Garden. Uh, in 1887, they had a beautiful ceremony, a beautiful uh, uh, time where they celebrated this whole occasion, and it was really worth the celebrations of 1843. Uh, fast forwarding as we must do to uh, other times, unfortunate times. Honolulu Transit Authority rears its ugly head for the first time in Honolulu. And it, it wishes to drive a tram straight through Thomas Square. People stop it utterly, it's gone instantly. Not like what we experienced, I guess. I, I take it. Okay. Uh, in 1925, they tried to drive Young Street through it the, by the Board of Supervisors. People stopped that. They made a joint resolution. For once, I think joint resolutions have an effect. I don't know how, uh, but uh, a law was passed saying that Thomas Square shall be maintained as a public park and Young Street shall not be allowed to be extended through it by city and county. That's on the books.
That law continues to this day uh, without the Young Street uh, part, but saying Thomas Square must be maintained as a public park. It's, it's, it's one of the protections, albeit under fixed state law. Now, in, they tried it again in 27 and 31, but in, in actual uh, 1932, they undertook uh, another uh, scheme. They, they curved, uh, they straightened out the path slowly, and they actually um, graded this whole area so that it was flat. And they put in the retaining wall, the Baratania Terrace, as well as uh, this fountain, and with black tile and colored lights. And, uh, you know, it was a beautiful thing to be held. People really loved it. And, and I guess when you have something like that, uh, you know, something beautiful, the military has to come and occupy it, you know. And they did. In 1942, they made barracks here. And they stayed here for the duration until 1945. They left. The governor said, don't have to restore it to its former condition. We'll house people who are building houses, who, who are houseless, uh, for the military. Now, the war ended. They no longer needed the houses. And um, they, uh, they actually, the property owners objected to having what they call the slum here. So I read about these accounts, and it's the same attitude towards people who don't have housing. It was unfortunate. But in any case, they, the governor then decided to uh, just negotiate with the military through uh, the city and county to restore it uh, with predictable results as, as uh, the military's reputation we know now you know, happened then. Uh, they restored their reputation. <laughs> uh, now, um, in 1966, they came here and uh, George, George Walters put in the Union Jack, as we see here. He, he helped the, uh, extend the comfort station here, and he is said to build the coral walkway up there, but I, I'm, that, that may be apocryphal. Uh, in 1970, uh, they wished to extend uh, Ward Street into the Thomas Square. This was objected to by so many people that they formed a group called the Ad Hoc Committee to Save Thomas Square, Life of the Land, Outdoor Circle, I think Daughters of Hawaii. They, they stopped it. And as a result, it was put on the National Historic Registry uh, to this day. Uh, although we're not part of the United States, they still, it's still on them. Uh, and then we come around full circle back to Kekuni Blaisdell and when he came here at La Jolla. Mm -hmm. And if, if you want to say one minute, or, or one did you already minute. talk? Or did you already talk about, uh, talk about the Kekuni? I don't know. Yeah. Actually, it goes all the way back, man. All right, all the way back, all the way back. All right, going back. Uh, La Jolla, La Jolla was observed by the nation until 1893. What happened was that the provisional government banned the observation of La Jolla, but people did it anyway. What really killed La Hoi Hoi Ea was not the local guys, it was the feds, believe it or not. In 1917, they passed the Anti-Sedition Acts, which said that you could not say anything bad about the United States. You're celebrating La Hoi Hoi Ea, you're saying, look, this place is independent, you have no business being here. It's, you know, so you're talking bad about the United States, then it becomes a federal rap, and you get thrown into federal prison, okay? And that's really what killed La Hoi Hoi Ea. That's also what killed the Hawaiian language. Basically, they said that, you know, well, the Norwegians were complaining because Norway was not at war in the First World War. And they said, why are you banning us from speaking Norwegian? And they said, no, because you're speaking a foreign language. You're disparaging the United States. So that's actually where the Hawaiian language disappeared. It wasn't because of the local folks, it was federal level. But at any rate, so, and so it was. I mean, that's what Ahui Aloha Aina um, and um, the, all those groups actually dis disbanded and they merged with the Democratic Party because it was fear of being prosecuted on the Sedition Act's federal level. But anyway, so La Hoi really wasn't that much observed at that point. 1980s, Kekuni Blaisdell comes back and we're going to celebrate La Hoi Hoi Ea. And uh, uh, Kalama told you about what was happening. Times have changed. We have evolved too. When, when Kekuni was here, it was like, okay, we've got to decolonize and we've got to reestablish sovereignty. But we've learned things about 
since then. And we know better now. Okay? We know that we've been occupied. It's not colonization. We've been invaded and occupied by a foreign power. But that, this is what has, has come. So Kikuni was instrumental again, as she said, sometimes we have dozen people here. And it would be like having a picnic here. But still, it was observed. And it was important to remember these holidays. You keep your national consciousness alive. You know who you are by keeping these holidays and places alive. And that's what Kikuni did. And now it's, again, times have evolved. And look what we have now. We don't protest anymore. We're celebrating. We're celebrating a great national holiday. And that's what we're doing now. Let's protest it. Now we're going to talk about uh, what's presently happening with Thomas Square. Uh, really, the, the yes. Thomas Square. So far, I know the royal family, the Lancaster Award. The kingdom, yes. the, the United States, the government here, which is the occupier, yeah. or the federal? Well, it's crown lands. Under what? Under whom? This is, this is stuff I hope to research more. And you saw me in the archives. And Baron, Baron, okay. Baron yes. <laughs> okay, you know, the, in the Mahele, the lands were divided into three parts, for the people, for the elite, and for the government. And of the government lands, these were split into the crown lands and the government lands. And the original intention was that the government lands were going to raise revenue to run the government. And the crown lands, the intent was for the, these, these grounds to raise revenue to run the office of the king. You know there were no income taxes in the kingdom of Hawaii. And the, the government didn't spend one penny to run the office of the king. None of that stuff. The running of Elon Musk, none of that stuff. All that came from revenues generated from the crown lands. And this was not the only piece of crown lands, but it goes all the way to the Mahele, um, and, and the designation of the three parts and the government lands. It's government. I, I think there know, was a I law, there was a case that was established that whoever it's a king, reigning, kingdom. Whoever the reigning monarch is, is the person in control of the crown lands. Yeah, it, it wasn't the property of Kauikia It wasn't the property of Lili No, I'm, I'm going on. This belonged oh, to the here. nation to run the king, the office of the, of the monarch. So there's no title to it. This belongs to the nation. The, the kingdom, not the U.S. nation. The kingdom of Hawaii. It's not somebody's private property. Yes, it's, it's, uh, yeah, and the, the, the changes, the new changes, is still is under international law and that still continues to this day. So all that I'm mentioning here is basically fake state, you know, precedent and law here. But it also talks about genuine uh, feelings in Nalahui about uh, how they are, again, uh, just coming, coming with a top-down type of changes as they always do. And that's exactly what ha what is happening with this new transference from uh, Department of Parks and Recreation to Department of Enterprise Services. And uh, in this top-down thing, they have had no real official hearings where they're going to record uh, and and make available for people to see testimonies. They've had all these meetings they've talked about, but no one knows anything official. And it's it's like taking off the steam little by little. There's no official public comment, like Doug was saying. Web page, email address, no postal address for public comments, or and you know, discussions at the neighborhood board were scarce. So that is why the neighborhood board outrightly rejected this plan, and they got the uh, and Kobayashi to take out 1.9 million dollars from the budget for the other stuff they wanted to do with with the square. And I have a map in there I never brought with me. Um, they. They, now, we had to go into the uh, state archives and actually dig up some uh, memos here. And uh, in this memo, an internal transfer of jurisdiction and operational control of Admiral Thomas Square from the Department of Parks and Recreation to the Department of Enterprise Services in order to combine the plan redevelopment 
of both parcels into a single cohesive project under the Blaisdell Center Master Planning Excursive, presently managed by DES. So they wish to take it into the Blaisdell campus and use it when they renovate the place and maybe move Blaisdell campus forward. So they have, they have this open space uh, to, to treat as they will. I'll, I'll get into some of uh, their possible changes. Later, they said, Mayor Caldwell plans to transfer the management and operational control of Thomas Square from DPR to the Department of Enterprise Services for the purpose of incorporating the square into you know, the campus and implementing uh, a program of public events consistent with civic centers and town squares. Now, this is, this is key because they wish to take it out of parks and recreation and put it into their definition of what is a park. And really, they're trying to erase the word parks so that they can implement the plans they want to do. So that's what they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to not make it a park. And as we see, it's been a park since, you know, yeah, 18, 18, at least 1853 is when I heard it was dedicated. Um, they have a different mission besides. The Department of Enterprise Services takes on the privatizing model. Their department mission is to manage and market a diversity of community-oriented facilities and services for the use and benefit of the public supporting cultural, recreational, and educational opportunities and events towards a self-supporting basis. Now, Department of Parks and Recreation uh, mission is to enhance the leisure lifestyle and quality of life for the people of Oahu through active and passive recreational opportunities. Looking at the uh, mission statements, helping to manage and market things using the capitalist model of a self-supporting basis is not the same as enhancing the leisure and lifestyle and quality of life for the people of Oahu through active and passive recreational opportunities. Uh, they're really different models. Um, I'll get into that. The Department of Enterprise Services manages the zoo, municipal golf courses, Blaisdell Recreation Center, Waikiki Shell, and Waha City Concessions. Uh, they also prop propagandize heavily the narratives of colonialism, uh, the, the fake state government priorities, and exploitive capitalist solutions. There is a conflict of interest here in exploiting a place and protecting it. That never does well. And, and really, uh, we've seen it played out on the earth itself, and we are endangered by this kind of exploitative capitalist system, in my opinion. Uh, they will cater, cater towards certain priorities of this paradigm. They will have to protect parts of the hierarchy that they're catering towards. Certain groups they'll emphasize to come here. They have to protect their clientele. Others, like the folks we see at Funa Bombs, our friends, they'll, they'll kind of shun them away. They're putting in all new grass. They'll say, don't stay on this grass, you know? Um, and people don't know all these rules. And they're gonna bring security with that. They will easily bring security. We had an experience with security recently, I even at the meeting, it's ridiculous. Uh, we took a photo and they came over and called the police. You can't do that, of a security guard. So security guards won't be informed. There'll be a lot of shenanigans. Instead of letting the community handle things, like in a park, they will emphasize security and protection. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'll wrap up here. Uh, if they reinforce, if they enforce the rules, uh, different permits will be enforced by law and not by the people. Okay, now look at the way that the city handles things by raids on people's houses all across the land here already. That, that's their attitude. And here at Thomas Square, there's great evidence for the way that they're gonna approach management here, especially if it's privatized. Look at the planters there. That's the way they work with the community. This is the manner of uh, control and domination we already see and evidence. I can go into more, it, I'd like other people to bring up other, other questions, but I'd like to uh, uh, pass the mic on to um, uh, Lalani with some words. I think Lauren had a question oh, for yes. you. Please. Lauren? Wait here, let me... privatization to a park? They, they wish to change it from parks so they can take on the model of Blaisdell. So yes, they have to make a profit off this place. It needs to be self-supporting. So um, this brings in a whole new paradigm instead of leisure and uh, community community sharing. It, there, there is a precedence. And I'm anti-capitalist. Anybody can approach this from whatever 
paradigm they wish, but they are taking away the park. Don't be mistaken by that. And they, they've actually, the EA hasn't gone through, so they're, not, they're gonna have to put off their plans. Right now it's in the, in, the, in the hands of Susanna Case at DLNR. She will approve this at BLNR. And she, she is deciding uh, whether or not this, uh, this, this kind of goes through. Okay, so I'm just going to do a real quick uh, overview of some of the concepts that I think are really important in this picture. As Oren was saying, this, the current change from the Department of Parks and Recreation to the Department of Enterprise Services, which, as he said, needs to be what they call self-sustaining, economically self-sustaining. In other words, it has to pay for itself, so it has to make money, right? So it is taking away from being a public park. It is taking Thomas Square out of the purpose that it was originally placed in the 1850s, you know, by the Ali'i for this purpose in dedication to La Ho'i Ho'i'ea, which we are at right now, you know, and it is being put into a money generating model, you know, which, uh, which is to be flavored with air. And um, let me talk about that just a little bit. Okay, so as I'm sure, as was covered very well by uh, Baron and by Oren, this place has a very, very strong connection to this holiday, La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, right? La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, the return of Ea, of sovereignty. Now, this is very, very, very important because we're talking about not only the day that the British did the right thing by restoring the sovereignty of the kingdom which they had, you know, wrongfully taken, which the United States has yet to do, but also it was acknowledging the concept that was very well articulated by Kaui Keo Uli that day, very famously, right? Which is Uamau Keea Okaaina Ikopono, right? That is the theme for La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, right? For the Ho'i Ho'i of the Ea is Uamau, to continue on endlessly without being able to stop. Wamau ke ea, the air, the life breath, the sovereignty, oka'aina, of the land, of all of the land, ikopono, of right in righteousness, right? So, the reason that I bring this up in relation to this topic, right, is that, you know, Oren had mentioned about um, the oppression repeatedly of the houseless at this place. Now, he and I and others come here every single week and we feed people. Why do we do that? You know, I mean, there's lots and lots of people who are who are houseless and who don't have um, who don't have food or don't have shelter, but we come here every single week, every Sunday we are here, you know, and and others too. And we're feeding people and we're giving them the things that they need, um, that they can make shelter from. Why is that? It's because of Pono. And the reason for that, fundamentally, we need to go back further than the first La Ho'i Ho'i Ea. We need to go back to the day that Kalele Iki hit Kamehameha over the head with a paddle, right? And why did he do that? He did that because he was a Makainana who was being oppressed by 
power that did not have the right to oppress him, right? And so what did he do? He picked up his fishing paddle and he whacked the guy, right? <coughs> and from that comes our first law, our first law of the kingdom, which is kanawai mamalahoi. It means that the you know, that everyone without power is to be protected from those who have power and may abuse it. And so when you go to those people who have the least power, and in this case, we're talking about a lot of people. Some are Kanaka, and let me tell you, there's some people with some deep genealogies who come here. There are also people from all over the place. There are refugees from the United States. There are people from other lands. There are all kinds of people. They're all to be treated the way that our Ali'i treated people in the kingdom, which is with pono, with aloha, and with, by taking care of them. And that's how you have a right to be a government. If you don't take care of the people, you don't have a right to be a government. And so, that is the concept of pono as far as political power goes fundamentally fundamentally and this is universal you know this is to our kingdom but it's also a universal concept pono is determined by correct treatment of those who have less power than you do and so this park plan right this park plan the plan is to block this entire area off in order to turn it into a commercial zone. Honestly, that is what they're doing. They're turning it into a self-sustaining commercial zone, not for the purpose that the Ali'i gave it to the people of Hawaii, but for the purpose of making money so that it can be self-sustaining. And I went to one meeting and in, or very early on with the, the developers of the, you know, the planners who were developing the park and the words that they used were world-class destination. They want to make this a world-class destination. That, those were their words, okay? And that is what they're standing on. And you know, when you talk about world-class destination, they're not talking about a destination for you or me, okay? They are talking about destination for those people who come from outside and who have money to make the park quote-unquote self-sustaining, right? Who will pay the money. Now, they don't care. They're, they're happy if you or I wander through here. They're happy if there's a statue of Kaui Keo Uli that everybody can go, oh, look! How wonderful, you know, just like how they do to the Queen statue behind the state legislature, right? While they're making all their have our rules and stealing land and stealing water, there's the Queen looking at them and they're quite happy, you know? People go there and they take pictures and, you know, fine, as far as they're concerned. Fine if there's a statue of Kau Ikeauli. Fine if there's a big plaque telling the story of Thomas Square. Fine if there's a big, huge Hawaiian flag flying. You can have the most giant flag in the world. You can have a flag as big as this park flag and they don't care as long as they're making money and as long as they keep their power. So, I'm gonna say that I, for one, will not trade the essence of Ea for the image of Ea. Ew. Ew. So, I want everybody to keep their eyes out because this is a very intense thing that's coming up. You know, they're talking about blocking this entire area off. And that's, they're blocking it off to the people who live here. They're blocking it off to the people who practice culture here. They're blocking it off to everyone. Because I'll tell you right now, they don't really want us here. They don't really want us here now. They would rather have 
their people doing this and they've proved that because they had their own lahoyoy air. And the only reason they're not doing it right now is because it was a complete farce and a flop. Honestly, it was ridiculous. I was there being chased by police. And, um, you know, some of, some of the others of us were here too on that day. And Pono was here, you know, and those of us who witnessed it can pretty much say, I think it was, it was, it was so incredibly lame that they can't do it because they don't know how to do it. They would love to have this La Hoi Hoi Ea be their little gem, their little cultural gem that they can show. Oh yes, we support sovereignty, we support culture, we support history while they are kicking the shit out of people who have no home. And we're talking Hawaiians who have no home. You know, while they are breaking the kanavai that supports our land. They will be very happy to make this La Hoi Hoi Ea the gem that they can say, oh, we support it, we sponsor it, we, you know, we're, we're totally behind it, blah, 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 blah. While they send the police after us, after the people who are walking through here, who you will see, who live here because they have nowhere else to be. While they are kicking out the people who this park was made for. So I just want people to think about that, okay? Mahalo. Eyo, Eyo. Can we, can we hear it for Lalani? Thank you. Eyo. Eyo, Eyo. I'm here for Baron. So, so like everyone else, um, of course, I am very concerned about the park. And um, one of the things that I found out this week is that it is on the National Historic Register. So if it is on the National Historic Register, what, what can we do, since it's on the National Historic Register, what can we do um, where the National Historic Register says that any, um, any park, house, place that is on the National Historic Register uh, is then protected, right? So if it is, how do we then use that um, to, to make sure that the park continues to be protected? That's number one. Number two is, what is the plan for us going forward? What is the plan going forward um, to organize around this? Because it's important that we have the information now, we have the history. Oftentimes what happens is we get stuck in the emotion and then we don't take the steps. So one of the things I would like to suggest is that we use this kind of gathering to get into the steps going forward who's going to organize it, and how people can participate in it. The National Register only like um, is dependent upon the participants. Um, is, that, is that something you know? Or is yes. That, yeah. Okay, so can you tell us what it looks like? Can you tell <laughs> us what the, it, it looks like this. Yeah. It's can like the, the National right? Register is um, something that's um, there's no obligation for a national register. It's something that politicians like turn on or turn off so that they're. It says that it shouldn't be changed. According to the 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 committee. Okay, the committee can approve whether or not things are within historical context. It hasn't. It hasn't been approved by Shipley. This plan. Now, now the thing about this plan, Matt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah, thing though is, it's like it's it's, it's, it's just about like who is in the committee and who approves it. Give it to Orin. Thank you, Kilevai. And that, that is an important question, and thank you for participating in. Uh, right now, 
the plan is to take out all the grass. That means the historic paths. I brought this up to Guy Kukui. He really didn't have really much of an answer. He said, that doesn't really affect the historic registry, but I contend these, these paths are historic. You see, uh, since 1966, I think that's 50 years. Um, and it is a historic monument, so these are paths. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, right now it's at Shipti, it hasn't been returned. If they come here, we stand in front of the bulldozers and say, you don't have a permit. And, and we, we just tell them they don't have a permit. They send people over here to stop it. But that's, since it's not approved, they can't move forward with it. How do we be proactive? Exactly. Well, okay. How can we be proactive? Right, right. Okay, the, the idea of this discussion was to open a discussion with all of you. So we want to hear from you ideas. And then we can really move on from there. This is an opening with the Lahui. So I'd like anybody else to have any, any ideas on what you think about this and, and just give us your manao. A anyone, please. Mm -hmm. Make sure you check out all of our today. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, in in a key, you are independent. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you mean, we got to stop playing you out. And we got to, we got to read that you're angry. <laughs> And think about we can think about think we have to probably think about we don't need them. They have no power. They're nothing. We have the power. But and let's be you yet. And you think about it angry. Okay, can I? So, Kome Aloha, um, just to, you know, over the, the issue over, um, over nat the National Historic Register, one thing that it's important to know is that the listing that they did was very, very short. And it didn't really go a whole lot into the kingdom or any of that stuff. It was it was it was a very very short listing, and the um, the way that it works, it goes by that listing, you know, in in terms of what could be protected. Now, Oren is correct that there are pathways and things like that that are listed that that could be in question. But the overall bigger picture, it might be. Um, whether that could be used or not, it's it, it's it's hard to say. And I, I just looked up, um, you know, just so that I get the wording right. But um, see, for restriction rules and regulations on historic properties, um, that basically the, the the short answer is a property owner can do whatever they want with their property as long as there are no federal monies attached to the property. So. That's the problem. Is that unless it's unless there's federal funding involved, um, it's it, it's hard to enforce. It it does play into state law, but it's it's much more complex. Thank you. Yes. So going forward, what I would like to suggest is that we form a hui to protect Thomas Square. And I would be willing to serve on that buoy. Okay, so that we do that in order that we begin to organize, and we don't leave the park today without leaving everybody here with some idea that we're organizing a buoy to protect Town Square. Okay, that that's the beginning, and that people who are willing to participate in that 
make arrangements to come together to then determine what it is we're going to do. Right, my bot? <laughs> but what it is we're going to do and then begin to set some timelines so that we let everyone know what is happening going forward. Can, can you write, could, could you write some of that down too? Uh, I mean, I can, I, but what we, we have, we have all the documents that I could collect on Executive Order 3873, which established uh, the management and control to city and county. Uh, we have like hundreds of documents there, a lot of maps as you see here, a um, lot of resources. And if you want to leave your number or leave questions, we're going to do this event tomorrow at 1 p.m. again. So come with your questions tomorrow and ideas. And yes, yes, Michael. Can you can we create a Facebook page? What the plan is? Facebook, no. page, a Facebook page to protect. No, no, no. Right, right now, I, I let, let's go uh, to tomorrow, and we'll see uh, what's happening. Right? Wait, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, that's a good idea. Um, we're doing Mumbai. Well, yeah. well, we'll figure out who first. Now, are there any? I like to still open up the floor. Does anybody else have any, any ideas, Baron? Anybody? Uh, we we want we want to hear more about uh, what the Lahui thinks, and that's just what it was about. Hello, my just came. So. <laughs> This is, I always heard of Thomas Square and my, another suggestion and you know, you don't have to follow this or not, but this is just an idea that we write letters to uh, the representatives or all these Ahupua out of businesses across the street about how we come here together. We, every year we come here together um, for our EA and um, we educate them and inform them so that we can gain their support. Um, that's just an idea. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. And just to remind, yeah, that's beautiful because we want it to be not a top-down process and uh, we want it to be decent, you know, uh, by the people. So that, that's, an incredible, that's a good point. Uh, but talking about the hierarchies there, on the fake state side. Right now it's in Susanna Case's DLNR office. She can approve this, this ship uh, from uh, uh, Department of Parks and Recreation again to DES. So she's at BLNR, excuse me. And um, so that's one point. Guy Kuku Kaulu Kukui is on Enterprise Services. He's the one managing the thing with Chris Dacus. Uh, he's a project director. So, and also there's the mayor, obviously. So Doug wrote an article on this, and you know he's trying to educate people on this. We have a copy of his article there, okay? Well, at least a link, and um, there are vast amounts of resources. Uh, so, is, is there? Is, do we have any more ideas from, from anybody? Actually, yeah. Um. Wow. All right. I lived in a historic place. Uh, it was on. Uh, uh, it was in Kala. It was on Kala. Um, the historic place registry, all it demands is that you don't pay any taxes for that year. And you keep it as original as possible. In this case, I don't know that being a part, it would be subjugated to taxes. It's evident that the historical history is evidence that this place has been used for many different things. I don't know that it actually like falls under that. That would be to progress our desire. Um, I know that the historical place that I lived at, Lake Onkala Avenue, was many different things. It was a horse stable. In the 90s, it was a dog farm, of all things. And it still met its tax exemption purposes. So like, for historical basis, for tax exemption purposes, and whether some group wants to come forward and do that, that's fine. There are actually a couple societies that actually look after um, this part. And I don't know if they're currently active, 
but to look to them to for further guidance would be better. Orin. 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 My bottom, my bottom, my bottom. Please, please, please. No, please, stand up here. Um, I'm not part of the Lahui because I was born in Vietnam, but I have worked alongside Anani K. Trask and Kikuni Blaisdell and John Osorio and several of you for a long time. And I really am just scandalized and shocked to hear that they would even think of doing that here. But last year when I was here for the summer, I could already see Kurt Caldwell moving in that direction because he instituted the city's own celebration of AR, right? And I couldn't agree with you more that it, it's the pretense of support while destroying the very value and legacy of Lahui. So uh, I'm here with Donna Burns, who was one of the main organizers of Safe Sandy Beach. All those bumper stickers and t-shirts that you saw, she painted and she, she, she's the artist behind all of that. So in one sense, this scandalous action that they're proposing to do, I think could be turned into a gift to Galahui, to Lahui. I mean, they're attacking something akin to attacking the Vatican for Catholics, right? I mean, please, this is like attacking the center of the story of independence, of righteousness. I mean, it couldn't be a greater insult if they tried to have a competition. Who can tell us what's the greatest insult we could um, administer, you know? And in that sense, I think it could be turned into a godsend for the movement, right? And a, a movement, I think, as we've seen in the past, requires several approaches. What was suggested, uh, the most important suggestion I heard today was form the, the uh, hui right now and meet tomorrow and, and flesh it out. And you'll always have to continue to revise, but flesh it out. And on that count, it seems to me, I am a retired law professor, but I, I let me tell you a profound belief of mine, which is that battles are won not through law, but through political movement, right? However, however, using the law can be a tool in that bigger, legal uh, political movement so i think the the hui, uh, the, the hui that is formed for to, to to expose this crime this scandal should have a group that will research you know national historic law things like that to show how they are violating their own laws perhaps right but you know those laws you know i mean there's something much more important than law which is history legacy respect for uh, the independence that you are that you know Kanaka Maoli have been seeking. So perhaps the Hui tomorrow would consider okay which group will kind of flesh out the law so that we can show where they are like they are violating their own law. Other groups, for example, what Yahoo said to reach out to other members of the community. I wouldn't put too much faith in converting the corporations myself. But you know there's nothing wrong with the ordinary citizen who is not evil in heart and can sympathize or educate them, but primarily, you know, organizing the core of the Lahui against this unbelievable attempt to insult the very soul of the movement. I mean, I, I think it's almost like the apology resolution. Thank you, you're giving us a fabulous gift. We will organize it. I can see bumper stickers and t-shirts, you know, for, for this all over the place. I remember when we were fighting the Sandy Beach thing, you know, so many cars at the bumper stickers uh, say Sandy Beach, you would be on the road and everybody was honking at us. I can imagine that happening. Sorry. <laughs> Lynette, would, would you like to share some words? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I just want to say this, and I know I might offend some people. My experience tells me that if somebody else is calling the rules and you play their game, you lose. And every time you play their game and you make some headway, they change the rules because they can, because it's their game. Basically, what I'm hearing people say is that let's play the game. We'll play the game, we'll organize among ourselves, we'll come out with this, that, and the other, and somehow we're going to prevail. Show me the history where that has ever happened. We don't prevail because as soon as you take a step forward, somebody steps in, 
and changes the rules. We know that. I'm going to point at the, the DOI hearings, right? So they have these hearings and people turn up. And something happens at these hearings that never happened before. People are saying stuff that nobody expected. And for me, because I'm watching this and I think I know like everybody who's in the, the struggle. I don't know these guys. How is it that all of these young people are stepping up and saying, you don't even belong here because you have no jurisdiction over us. That is a different message. That's a different message. What does it mean to step outside of the box? Our box is the box that we're in right now. We're going to make an appeal to the city. We're going to talk to all of these people who have made the rules over how places are going to be used and they're going to change their mind because they, they have an attack of conscience. Why would that work? I don't say I know how it's going to happen or what's a better way to come down, but my guess is that if you step outside of the box, you're likely to come up with a much better solution. Let us remember that in 19, 1999, this guy named Lance Larson took his stuff outside of Hawaii. He took it to the Hague, to the, the permanent court of whatever it's called, arbitration. Why? get education, get a lot of uh, PR, then it's not about the city, it's not about the state of Hawaii, it's about something bigger. I guess what I'm saying is you, print, you play the same game with the same rules, you get the same outcome all the time. I would ask people to consider doing like more than, more than has been presented so far. Do two things, do three things, but don't limit yourself to try to figure out how you can fit into the box that they've already created for you and expect to make some kind of change. I don't think that's going to happen. Mahalo. Mahalo the net. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, were you next? Can I, can I just okay. respond to that real quick? I just, want to, I just want to make a quick response to that because um, I want to make sure that everybody's clear about this one thing. We don't have a strategy right now. Okay? So it's not like people are planning to stay within the box or go outside of the box or anything, there, there isn't a strategy right now. Why isn't there a strategy? I'm, I'm gonna say that um, people have not really stepped up on this yet. The only people who have that, that I've seen are right there, Doug, Oren, um, you know, uh, some, yeah, some, and some people who aren't here, basically. So there's a small group, okay, and Karen, who I don't know where she is, but. Sir, did you want to I'll move the chair. Did you hold this? Could you hold this, Lena? I'll move here. Hello, Robert. Hello, dear. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Robert Ibanez. Uh, I've been involved with the movement for quite some time. I respect Lynette, Lonnie, uh, and uh, all the old timers here. Uh, we need to identify them and respect what they've done. Okay. There is a strategy. People ask me, what is the strategy? Well, the strategy is it's called the Hawaiian Patriotic Union. That's what it is. We don't have a body politics. In other words, this is not enough people. But we have a half a million uh, Hawaiians throughout the world. And much more supporters throughout the world. I want you to look at the Hawaiian Patriotic League. In fact, we should have one over here, a food. And tomorrow we'll have a food and across the uh, islands, and even Las Vegas. We want to gather people to come together, regardless of creed, regardless of political ties, because it's not a political organization yet, okay? Until we get the bodies, when we get 100,000, 200,000, then you're going to have the movement, moving in the direction that we want as components, that we want as our ancestors that we need to do. That's the answer. By becoming part of the illegal occupation uh, and of the state or federal, they've been trying to do this many years and it has not worked. It has worked for certain things, 
but most of the time it has not worked. And a lot of people ask me, probably what is, what is the answer to sovereignty? And I tell people back then, genealogy. And people laughed at me. But today I'm right. All of you have kuniana. I come from a royal blood. And it's our responsibility to make sure our people are taken care of, make sure our elders are taken care of, make sure our people, young people are taken care of for the next generations to come. And it will happen. Believe me, I'm that much determined. So, and also, we were at um, this morning at Rimpac in Waimanala, because I live in Waimanala. And because of, I'm a veteran, Air Force veteran, we could go to the gates. They have a big thing, I went with my cousin. Uh, so they, they have an operation. So go on Facebook, any other groups on my page, Robert Ibanez, you will see the video. Spread it around the world. Spread it around the world. As we talk about the occupation, as we talk about love, and about Keakua, and the beauty of our islands. That's what we are up against. They want to make it a white kiki in uh, Waimanalo? Ah, ole. Means no. It won't happen. Not in my lifetime. But that's what I present to you folks. Hopefully you guys can continue. Continue to organize, whichever way. But think of mind the patriotic league. Get a hold of that, and we, we can understand that your allegiance has to be to who? Tell me who your allegiance has to be. Anybody know? The kingdom? The queen? No. It's the people. We have our allegiance to our people. Then the kingdom can come together. As well as our queen, Lady Okalani. She was a bright lady. Kalakau is a different story. <laughs> but that's her brother. But Queen Lydia, uh, Lydia Kalani is a beautiful lady. Very strong religiously and very Akamai. So we should follow her, her, her path. And that's what she created, the Hawaiian Patriotic League in 1893, before the Kuwait. So with that, thank you very much. Aloha. Hey, Ben. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Love you. If, if no one else has anything to say, can I say something? Do you, you have? Okay. Make sure they don't touch. I just have one question. You know, I came late to this discussion. And um, this, this Aina that we're on right now today, where did the title from this come from originally? Okay. You want to right here? Yeah. Right here. Okay. This property is actually uh, Crown Lands in the Mahele. You know, the lands were split into three parts the lands for the Maka'ainana, the elite, for the government. And so the, uh, the government lands were split into the Crown Lands and the regular government lands. This is Crown Lands since the Mahele. It's never been private property. All right. Oh. Okay, this is all crown lands. Okay, it goes based back to the Mahele, where the lands are split into the lands of the Maka'ainana, the Ali'i, and uh, for the government. And later the government lands were split into the crown lands and the regular government lands. So this has never been private property. So, with you having said that, to me it's, it's really clear. There is no jurisdiction. Wow, that's it. Yeah. And, and you know, just for a little a additional, um, as Doug pointed out, everything that's run by uh, Enterprise Services, there's a fee. Nothing is free. Everything. You want to use it, you got to pay money for it. Okay. Item number two. Um, during the meetings, yes, there were all these things about um, world class. They want to turn this to a world class park. So I, I, who exactly in the world do you want to have using this park? Okay, you're talking about 
the gentrification of Waikiki, they're moving into Kaka'ako, and they're, 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 they're kind of sweeping up this direction. Okay. So this, this, they're, they're going to turn this to a tourist trap. That's what they want to do. They want to make it part of this big tourist attraction. Yeah, all the way from Waikiki to your multi-million dollar condominiums in Kaka'ako up to here. And that's what they really want to do. Nobody does anything. That's what it, what's going to happen to this place. It's going to be part of the tourist trade. We don't do anything about it. Or can you make sure that everybody knows that Kumealoha has a sign-up sheet? Okay, uh, Kumealoha has that's, that, that, I, I don't want you to walk away without knowing that. Um, so we have a sign-up sheet. If you seriously want to participate, if you seriously want to participate, please put your name on there. Um, I've agreed to um, share this, yeah? And so we will work on it methodically, do the research, and, and come up with a plan with deadlines and stuff like that. So you seriously want to, want to participate. Um, one of the things that um, those of us who live in urban Honolulu, uh, you know, we've been involved in the movement in supporting Kaho'olawe, supporting Waihole Waikane, supporting places outside of urban Honolulu. We closed our eyes to what was happening here. When we opened it up, we had Kaka'ako, you know, all of these other places in urban Honolulu that are designed to make our history and our people invisible. This is another one of those. So we cannot anymore close our eyes. This is the place where we're going to like fight for. Um, like we do in every other place, this is the place that we want to do it too. Um, this is a very, very, very historical place. This place means a lot to us. and. The city is moving really fast, so we need to organize and we need to move fast. There are ways, ways to respond to this. Some people want to protest, stand by gates, da da da, whatever. That's fine. The other way is that we need to organize methodically. We need to plan. We need to research, and we need to be at those places where people have already gone to for hearings and stuff like that. We need to continue to do that. We need to write the letters in such a way where they know that we're not, we haven't just fallen out of trees, that we're bright, intelligent people, that we know our history, that we're really committed to stopping the invisibility. So if you're really serious about participating and willing to put in the time, please sign your name to this, okay? And we'll start working as soon as possible. Thank you. So it's on the table. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's this, on the table. It's on the table. Uh, so, um, are, can you think of any other ideas or um, any other thoughts, any other questions? Because we're, we're here to... Uh, Mike, Michael, can we, can we give... Donna's been, Donna, Donna, Donna's, been Donna's, been Donna's been waiting. Do you mind? Sorry. Yeah, hi. I wanted to uh, mention that my band here, she and I met at the um, St. Sandy Beach thing. Um, I guess I was involved in anti-war activities from high school. I went to Kamehameha, uh, all the way from high school to... Um... Hold up the mic a little Oh, okay. Um, basically, I think what we discovered by doing that doing the safe sandy beach it seems like kind of a oh. thank you sorry i'll hold the mic you better write this out you have a weird i know okay um basically as we were embroiled in this this issue of safe sandy beach it wasn't about saving the beach by the way it was about stopping 151 high-end homes being sold on the mainland on kamehameha land and that's why I got involved. As a Hawaiian, I'm not Kauli, but I am Hawaiian. My mother's a Holt, um, just for the record. And I think that 
my Vaughn and I got to be immediate friends because we realized that the war in Vietnam, for example, didn't stop because of legislation. It stopped because people in the streets. Now, there was a guy, I don't know if you remember, a guy named Guard Kiroha, and he was the spokesperson for Bishop Estate. They called it Bishop Estate before, now it's Kamehameha Schools slash KSBE. But at that time, it was called, all of a sudden, people to undermine our validity were calling it, uh, not in my backyard, it's all it's a bunch of holidays. Oh, I got livid. I said, okay. So I called Ralph Sun, who was a friend of mine from high school, and Eric Enos, another friend, and everybody I knew that was a Kamehameha graduate, including your father, Kihei. Soli. I called your dad, and I said, I need help. I need Hawaiians to come forward. It is not a holiday issue. It is a matter of not selling Kamehameha land to the highest bidder to ruin that whole coastline. So um, the next day, I even got Irm Guard Aluli, who never signed anything, because I know the whole Aluli family from Kaido, which is where I'm from. for making this possible and for for all participating. This has been a wonderful day and I'd like to go over with you the, the history. It's, it's much more detailed as you see. And uh, we have a lot of documents there. Uh, fake state, albeit laws, it's it's there if, if, if you think some of those are key. And there are other uh, points that we just, we just skimmed, the, skimmed over this whole thing. And really what I learned coming into this is that uh, this is just the surface of the history of this, this place. And it, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, and now, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving us some of your time. We have the Kuwait petitions with, with, uh, with the 
long view here. Aloha everybody, my name is Nolene Todd Caldera. I have to throw that in there because maybe I'm related to somebody here. Um, anyways, I'm not the normal spokesperson um, that you may see with the Koei petitions, but um, Claire who and Jocelyn Costa are actually hosting um, La Hoi Hoi in Maui. And um, they were the ones that kind of initiated this um, push to get us signed up again to stand behind our kupuna to make their voices heard again through our voice um, and I'm not the, the public speaker that I really wish I should be but if I was under the tent with you I could really share a lot of information um, our kupuna signed in 1897 um, what they called the monster petition. And the monster petition was a way of standing up in solidarity, not sitting down crying and saying, woe is me, like the history books kind of told us. You know, they kind of told us, oh yeah, you guys just rolled over and let us come on in. Well, that is not the truth, because if you look at the signatures there, and you realize the number of signatures that there are between the the two, um, there were actually two protests that went through at the same time. Um, they represent 95% of the Hawaiian population that was there in 1897. Um, one of the key things that the Koei petition um, that our kupuna signed, one of the key things that it did, in my opinion, is it actually created the door that gave us the opportunity today to say we are a sovereign nation. Had they not presented that and had it read on the congressional floor, the United States Congress would have voted to annex us. What actually happened is they lost the vote. They could not annex us. So they had a little private meeting, you know, I don't know what handful of people. They had a private meeting and they put together what we call the joint resolution which is against U.S. constitutional law. So technically, I'm one of them that was fed the history. I read the history book. My grandmother read the history book. My father my mother had read the history book. We were fed lies. Today we know better. So I invite you to come over. We have put a database together that puts the, all the names in the Kuei petition in an alphabetical order to assist your search. When you find your Kupuna's name, you'll go to the book and actually look at their signature. You may have one of those moments that will knock you off your feet. It'll bring you to tears. It'll take your breath away. When it takes your breath away, just remember, the next breath you take is the breath of your Kupuna. And then I ask you, once you do that, to come over to our signing table and stand behind your kupuna and let their kahea come through your leo because you are continuing in their fourth steps. They're calling each and every one of us. Okay, aloha. I love you all. Please come and see me because guess what? I might be related to you and I know my genealogy really well. <laughs> Mahalo. So if, if there's uh, any other uh, community activities or any other announcements, uh, anybody, anything anybody else wants to talk about. I think the next group up here is at three, uh, and then there's, there's gonna be something big happening here at four with another panel. Yes. Ah. Okay. We have until three, right? We have until three. So, so. we can have a discussion on, on yeah. Yeah. national consciousness. Okay. Hawaiian National Consciousness. We'll have a talk on Hawaiian National Consciousness. I don't think people really know what that is. Darren, we would be talking. And the reason I say you is because you kind of brought it up when you were talking earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. About this place. <laughs> <laughs> that what people do. What? Neither are consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day. Here, sit down and talk about it. Yeah. Sit down, sit down. Yeah. Sit down. Relax. Actually, no, I like that. I want, uh, I want Dr. Cruz to start asking you questions. You, you tape them for your show. Introduce yourself. There we go. Hawaiian National Consciousness. 
Well, again, there was a speed effort under the Sedition Acts to erase the Hawaiian nation. And again, it was a federal level issue. It wasn't a state, it wasn't a territory issue, it was federal. And that's how you destroy a nation. You destroy a nation by getting rid of their language, you get rid of their history, you get rid of their national places. And that's how you extinguish, extinguish a nation. And so this is what we need to preserve. We need to preserve our our national places, our history, our language, and our symbols. The flag. Yeah, the flag being one. And so uh, this is the effort that we've been actually been doing now for some 20 years now. Um, and all of these places you've never heard of. You've never heard of these places, but they're here at Thomas Square in one of Oh. I want to ask that. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Thomas Square being incorporated into uh, the city and county of Honolulu? Into uh, Enterprise Services? However you want to interpret it. Basically, it's the gentrification of the whole of Honolulu. What they want to do is they want to turn the whole of Honolulu into a tourist place. It's, it's basically to exploit the place. They want local people out. They want tourists here. And that's why it's a world-class park. They want rich Turai to come here. They want us out. Okay, you know the history of it. I'm gonna come back to you in a second. I wanna ask Dr. Cruz, like, um, how you feel like about the uh, city plans for Thomas Square? I only know as much as you presented earlier today. I didn't know any of that information at all. I think it's... I'm gonna step out on a limb here. I'm gonna ask you a question. Is the city supporting this event today? The city is supposed to have um, co-sponsored this event according okay. to uh, the neighborhood board okay. um, probably like about two or three weeks ago. Somebody earlier brought up the idea that at some point if the city takes control of the park, the city will continue to do these celebrations without us. And basically, they'll take over how the celebration is presented and how the information about history is also presented. And I'm wondering, are we starting? That's why I'm asking you that question. That's the question that has come up, like at uh, the uh, the the board that just happened over here. Um, I'm not comfortable with it. There's like a lot of other people that weren't comfortable with it. Here, you can film this. Here, just hold the camera pointing in this direction. I wasn't comfortable with. I was. I wasn't comfortable with how uh, city's attorneys uh, presented and avoided that question. Are you kind of saying that they want us to continue to do what we're doing within? Are you saying that they want us to continue to do what we've been doing for the last uh, 20 years, but under certain strictures so that at some point we have to follow the rules of the, the history that we're presenting them to? I would say yes. Go ahead. Okay, the problem is that we don't know what the rules are. Um, the rules are entirely different from what the city parks are. They haven't made the rules. Enterprise services is going to go on. You, you know, you can't go through the Blaisdell. There's nothing going on. I don't know if you're allowed to come through this park if there's nothing going on. I don't think you can park in the parking yeah. lot. And, and so that's the issue. The issue is they're proposing that you, you take this on faith, okay? Somehow it's going to make this better. That... Um, <clears throat> Somehow or other, um, it's going to improve something about the park, but they're not going to tell you what the rules are because they haven't made the rules or you don't know what the rules are. Okay, so my question is, because I only know the stuff I read or see on Facebook or whatever people are, and your article that was printed, underneath it is a subtext. Subtext is we don't want any houses people in the park. How are we going to get rid of them? We can put up some barriers over there so they can't sit. We can do this, this, and at some point, since none of that stuff's working, let us just redo the whole park. And then they have to contend with the rest of us because we also use the park. So I can let me get some comment from you. Yeah. I can respond specifically to about how the rules have changed. Right now, as a park, 
Uh, the rules of the park are under the Honolulu ordinances. And the ordinances, um, you know, they go through the council and that sort of thing goes through hearing. Once it becomes under, comes under the uh, Department of Enterprise Services, it comes under administrative rules. They don't require hearings in, in the sense that we think the arguments are presented uh, before an authoritative body, the, that body makes a decision. They get to make the rules, they just ha have an obligation to let the public know what those rules are going to be. There's no obligation to take testimony, to record the testimony, or to even listen to the public. They just have to open it up for the public to comment, and then they make a decision on the Right now, for instance, uh, because it's government under ordinance, uh, protests can happen. You can have what's called First Amendment meetings without any kind of permit. That's going to change. That's going to change under Department of Enterprise Services rule. Because you can't do that across the street. That no, way. no pamphleteering. So, no pamphleteering. No, no banner. Pamphleteering. You have to get a. You have to get a. Oh, the, okay. What, oh, go ahead. What, the, uh, oh, what Guy Kaulukukui said. I said, well, how how can you know how can that be? What can the public do to have input? He said, well, you know, we can't force the change if there's a significant amount of discord. So actually, what I'm trying to do is help provide that significant amount of this part by telling people about it. Now, the way the changes were sold, you know, a lot of people here are actually for the changes because it was sold as, you know what we're going to do? We're going to put a flagpole up with the Hawaiian flag. We're going to put a statue up. We're going to make it nice for you guys. And that's all good. I like the flagpole, the statue, that kind of stuff. That's fine. But the cost of it is it goes to Department of Enterprise Services. Well, this and they an have to make of that. It becomes part of the Blaisdell Master Plan. Master Plan. Yeah. And I have to point out that let half a mile that way are the new Hey hello, we have um HPD here today. In, uh, you know, in Kakaako. So I don't think this stuff it's not for us, it's not for you guys, it's for the guys that haven't moved here. It'll be on every um, um tourist destination sheet and that kind of thing. And I'm going off the subject, I just wanted to respond about how the rules uh, are made and how, how, how it will change. No, 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 over here, over here. I want to hear this side. I'm not sure what the question is. I don't oh. want to respond to it. Okay. I was just going to add. I was just going to add. Uh, consciousness. Oh, consciousness. Okay. Okay. Well, let me just say okay. that then. What I, what I got from your presentation, Warren, is that when consciousness, I don't know how other people are defining it, but for me, it's just something that you did. It's not something you really think about. You just live it. Why do we feed people who are hungry? It's not because your mom said it. It's because you feel shitty if you're going to have a meal and somebody's sitting next to you and they got no food. You feed everybody. So the people that are coming here that you are feeding and all these guys with food, not bombs, they're practicing a Hawaiian national consciousness that they can't help themselves. None of us can. We can't sit by and let somebody be standing there or digging out trash from the trash can so they can eat if we have the means to feed them. That is part of the consciousness that I'm talking about that's connected to this place. We cannot help ourselves. And then so it's our kuleana because we were raised that way. And so I don't want it to change. It may, not, it may be detrimental to us because who the hell has money to be feeding a bunch of houseless, hungry, People every week, like you guys, you, you depend on donations of any kind, right? As long as it's vegetables, right? Yeah, thank you, Lynette, for yeah, donating so, so much. So you, you take the effort, somebody has to collect, cook, serve, you know, and take care of all these people that you don't even know or you may know now, not because of anything that they did, but because they're hungry. And so your, your national consciousness, your character, that you have inherited from your ancestors is basically your kuleana is to feed people who are hungry. That's it. And and I think that it's something that is not going to be practiced over here. 
when this place becomes a world-class tourist destination because the reality reality is none of us really give a rip about whether or not the tourists who can afford to come here are actually going to be eating healthy vegetarian food they can buy their stuff so then the question i would ask following this re-imagining of this kind of like fake tourist attraction who who deals with the impact of that on all the other people who have had benefit, not just the people who come to eat, but the people who have practiced learning how to serve. We serve. Somebody's gonna get hurt. Nobody gives a shit, right? Except the guys that are on the receiving end of the harm. Follow <laughs> Dr. Cruz. Yeah, and um, when, when all this criminal uh, all this criminal behavior uh, is done, it chain reacts throughout all society. So society gets meaner, we have challenges. And well, we get to be someplace other than Hawaii. Because it's not going to be Hawaii here. It's Waikiki. Extended Waikiki, right? It's, not uh, Hawaii. Yeah, they, they wish to... Uh, make it that way and, and so that's why we try to be egalitarian Actually, there and, and oh I was like um uh Dr. uh Dr. Chang you do uh La Hoya like back in the nineteen eighties I think um when Kikuni started was a small 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 group and yes the city like co sponsored this this year and thus far, it's like the sponsorship has been HPD. So, <laughs> <laughs> come eat, guys. <laughs> you guys hungry? Come eat. Oh, anyway, um, La Hoya like why here? Let's just do a uh, history lesson for those that don't know about La Hoya. Why? Oh yeah, you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> All right. You know, we talk about HPD being here. You know who the first cop killed in Hawaii was? The first uh -oh. guy. You know who that was? That was on January 14, 1893. The provisional government guys were running weapons through downtown. And this cop stopped them because they were running away and speeding through downtown. So this cop stops this guy. This guy shoots the cop. And that's why everybody ran over there to see what was going on. And that's when they ran over to um, the Elite Iulani building and they, they, they put up this thing saying, yeah, well, the, the, the kingdom is overthrown and we're taking over. And then they ran away after that. The guy's name was Kealoha, a cop. He dies the next day at, at um, um, Queen's Hospital. They never prosecuted a guy who shot him. Okay. These guys were cop killers. And it wasn't, you know, that there was you know, bloodshed, okay? And I think HPD needs to review that, okay? Because as far as I know, none of us have ever heard any cop. It was those guys who did it. And they erased that from memory. Yeah. So HPD should actually be our allies in all of this. And you'd be surprised if they're sympathetic. You'd be surprised. Uh, no, that that wasn't what I was expecting. I, I appreciate that. That's like a history that I did not know. Um, I was always taught, I always thought, I was always taught that we're so lucky to be a state. <laughs> I always thought that we're so lucky to be a state. It was like, wow, these like Christian guys came over and like saved us. Not for that guy, Ki Aloha. I was like, wow. How did they save us? Um, we have parents that think of us, love us. We have we have a lead. We have leaders, true leaders, in pretty much a democratic society. Because in our democratic society, we kill the elite that were not fit to serve. And it didn't have to be braggart. It could be in the middle of the night and we blame our tutu. Oops, how did that happen? But that's not here nor there. 
Mm. Mm. Okay. All these years, all these years out here, and wow, this was like the outskirts of Honolulu. Let's okay. Let's embrace that. Let's embrace that. Oh, say again. It's Pulao Kahua, and it was a relatively dry place, and you had uh, a lot of a um, lot of uh, strangly uh, sheep there, and I mean not sheep but livestock, and hardly any houses. There was barely any water. People really didn't want to want to come uh, generally to this area except to cross it. And uh, slowly, with the introduction of water, uh, they actually started um, extending the streets out towards Makiki across the plain and um, this this is the actual plain right here by Peter T. Young I need to look at the primary sources about it but it's, it's uh, uh, kind of flat here Peter um, T. Young may not be the primary source yes yes okay. he's not yeah. so, you know, ex-CEO of H.E.I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> missionary, Although, missionary descendant oh I see okay. um, but um, as you see, some of these maps go through the iteration of Thomas Square, and this, this one's a pretty neat one. Um, it, it is in the Ahupua of Kewalo, and uh, that extends from up there all the way down to the sea. So this is the Waina part, middle part, I guess, uh, I'm told. And um, now, um, in, in answer to one of your query questions, I, I was thinking that when coming here, you know, it, what one should just be who one is, and I think that's 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 integral to any response to any kind of force, and not and, and just remember that truth because there's so much pressures to to play the deceptive game, to play that secret garden, to be enamored with the flowers in it, and to play all these games, but it gets you so distracted from who you are and from the truth, you get lost. So, in the deceptions of the fake state, uh, you get anywhere near there, you gotta realize it's a dangerous game, because, you know, you'll, you'll get that on you. Um, now, um, so, actively being who you are, I guess, trying to, and building these kind of communities I think in a decentralized way has succeeded in other societies there are there are millions of ways to do this our history goes back very far and you know don't manage the imagination you know entrepreneurially just just think uh, just know that there are many possible futures as, as my friend Lindsay mentioned and uh, thank you Lindsay and she did uh, she did a workshop uh, including on this topic but you wanted to mention about the, the, the article, and could you mention that article? This is on Thomas Square. This is a document she discovered. Um, yes. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, so I was doing a little bit of research trying to figure out uh, what the budget has been for Thomas Square and also uh, how it's, the budget's going to be used. Um, and so far, I found an article that was published in the Honolulu Star Advertiser um, on May 31st describing the budget a little bit uh, in detail. And um, what I found was that um, Chris Dawkins, planner in charge of special projects for the Department of Parks and Recreation, estimated the entire project here at Thomas Square uh, would cost about $8.3 million. And um, a firm, a design firm called PBR Hawaii, was paid so far um, 800,000 or 820 thousand dollars to develop just the master plan. Um, so they're a private firm that is now working on that. Oh, Thomas Square, hmm. come back. Always, uh, like Gwen said. You can, one thing you can count on, they're always going to do something really stupid. And they've done the most stupid thing here. The most insulting thing, to desecrate in the, in the face of federal recognition and everything. They want to bury, they want to make statues. No. This was about the Aina. So Thomas Square is, to me, 
second half of the game, coming out of the locker. Where are we going to go? How are we going to do it? Thomas Square, they have brought the issue up. So, thank you, Oren. All of the information here, I brought my sign-making pens and stuff. Two weeks, what kind of pressure? We can save Mauna Kea? How, what, how are we going to save Mauna Kea? How are we going to save the Awais? How are we going to save the pollution from keeping on coming? How are we going to deal with all the out-of-control immigration? We have step up from Thomas Square. I recognize it. This is truly a white man. The most sacred thing, I grew up in this park. I was a baby boy walking around up here. You know, and I look across, I go, well, where's the outdoor circle when you need them? Okay? The people need to come. The people gonna come. You know, Kaholave, it's not just a matter of how many, but how true. And so for me, this is what brings the next, this is the next agenda. And I'd say, we can hold the ground here, but to go to City Hall, which was once an honorable place where people served the public instead of serving themselves. Corporation, and push yourself. For all the money, I mean, I wanna get the stats. We can have some great signs. You know, oh, the governor, the legislature gives a million and a half people for uh, dollars for the homeless. But they're going, how much money are they going to spend on this park? It's election year. Pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Not over. DOI, it's coming out of the DOI, has to go to the United States Congress. I'm glad that we have a venue, Laulani. So, on it. Tenacious, you cannot stop us. Permits, right to the State Department. All the permits, you have no idea what it takes. But it had you had to have the purpose, and then you have to get the permits. We know the venue. We know that there, we know the steps. And down here, we have the issue. So that's what I'm picking up on now. So I've come here to do my homework, and I'm thankful that there's all of this information is here. So anyway, I think I talked long enough. All right. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you, Aaron. Hey, that was the Aaron getting promoted here. <laughs> Admiral, uh, Admiral and a general. <laughs> and, uh, and everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, these waters raise all boats. So. Aloha. I, I'm now letting Lauren ask me to talk a little bit about um, one of the one of the issues here at, at Thomas Square. Um, you know, here at La Hoyoyea, here we're it's July 31st. This is our national holiday, our major, major national holiday. And the theme of this holiday, as everyone knows, is Uamau Ke'ea Oka'aina Ikapono. Right? Uamau Ke'ea Oka'aina Ikapono. And so that's the, that's the one thing that um, I need to clarify in relation to the ongoing practices here at Thomas Square the ongoing cultural practices and the ongoing um, air that flows here. So one of the things that I want to um, I want to be kind of clear about is that um, a lot of those practices are, are, are unknown. Like this is super awesome, you know, where we have a big event with big big tents and all of that, it wasn't always like that, right? <laughs> My Vaughn knows and some some of us who were here when there was like six people, you know, in 1990 and stuff like that were, you know, way back. Um, remember those days. And another thing that is often not seen are those people who actually live here and Really, honestly, I want to talk about that a little bit because often uh, the houseless are used as an excuse 
for why a lot of destruction is needed, why they need to block off the entire park, including that corner over there, which is cement. And why would they need to block that off the entire time? The reason is because, for one thing, some of us here come down here every single week, or in especially, and, um, and provide food and provide stuff for people, a lot of whom are Kanaka Maoli and a lot of whom are not, you know? And the reason for that, fundamentally, at least for me, is that if we are to restore air, right? If we are to restore air, right? Ho'i ho'i air. If we're going to have that air be restored, we need to be Pono, because a Pono government is the only real government. And we're talking about something where respect for human rights needs to come number one first, and care of the people. So when we talk about uamau ke ea, right, the, the ability to exercise sovereignty, oka aina, this land, ikapono. So pono and ea are so tied together that they cannot be separated. They cannot be separated. So for for a, a lot of us, we look around at what is really Pono. Well, we know what is not Pono. What is not Pono is the breaking of Kanavai Mamalahoi, our first law of our kingdom, which fundamentally is about protection of the people. So in other words, if the people are not being protected, Right? If the people are being oppressed by a government and not protected by that government, then it is not Pono. That government is not Pono. And according to our ancient traditions, that government comes down. And that is what Kanavai Mamalahoai says. Heva no make. It is not fooling around. Okay? Heva no make. So, in this case, I'll tell you, I have been here at this place when there were raids on people's houses, when there were children who were, you know, who were dragged away, whose stuff was, was, was dragged away and dumped in dumpsters. I've seen um, people's medications, their ID, I've seen people crying, you know, their blankets taken. All of us who've been here have seen this. And a lot of them are Hawaiians. Not all, but a lot are you know, that this is happening to, where Kanavai Mamalahoi is being broken in front of our eyes. We've seen people arrested trying to stand up for these people and dragged away and thrown in jail for 30 days just for standing inside of a tape line, not even blocking anything. You know, that was our friend Madori, who's a real hero. And so, you know, that is what is, that's something that's really important here. Because when they talk about redoing this um, park, a lot of it, yes it is, to change it from a public space, which is what the Ali gave it for, to a private space, a money-making space for the city and county, you know, that is part of their purpose. And part of their purpose also is to rid this place of the unfavorable elements. And those unfavorable elements, quite honestly, are the houseless and those who stand for the houseless and those who stand for sovereignty in a real way. You know, it's easy to have a plaque with a history on it. That's great. Maybe it'll attract some more tourists to take pictures of it. You know, it's easy to have a big giant Hawaiian flag. That would be nice, I totally support it. But not at the expense of our air, which is tied to Pono, which is tied to righteousness, which is tied to the protection of human rights for everybody. Because you know what? The, that is what the kingdom did, was protect the human rights of every single person. And if you cannot protect the human rights of every single person, you do not deserve to be a government. 
And right now, there is a government in place in the city of county, in the city and county of Honolulu, which does not protect the human rights of people. It drags people out of the little housing that they have. It takes their stuff, it takes their blankets, it takes their food, it puts them out in the rain. You know, remember that uh, that that almost hurricane that happened? A couple, what was it, like last week, right? Okay, yeah, Saturday and Sunday, right, on Sunday. I come down here, Orin is down there with a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> Orin keeps a snorkel handy for good reason. But he's down there with a three-legged tent, right? The thing was barely standing up, and he and two houseless guys are pushing the rain off of the tent so that they can feed people because they had nowhere to go. People are, like, huddling under this. Why do they have nowhere to go? Because the city and county has pushed them from the little that they have. They can't be anywhere. Their rights are being oppressed, and we're talking about the basic human right to exist. Yeah. The basic human right to exist. And this is Kanaka and non-Kanaka. You know, and if we're gonna be serious about Ea, and we're gonna be serious about any kind of restoration, we'd better be serious about how we're gonna take care of people. And taking care of those people right now in our restoration of Ea means standing up for them and standing against those who oppress them. And this changing over of the park is directly, make no doubt about it, is oppression of the people. That is part of its purpose. It's one of the major parts of the purpose is to push people further out to not give them any space to exercise air of any kind, right? Of any kind and to control that. If, if air is controlled, it's not air. You know, if air is controlled by a, another power, by a government power, it is not air. So if we're gonna stand for something real, if we're gonna stand for air, if we're talking about ho'i ho'i in air, we better be real about pono. And we better be real about what that means in terms of taking care of the people who are all around us. All, all around us, you know and being aware of what is being done to them. And, you know, maybe not everybody can stand up in front of, um, you know, in, a, in some cases it's a bulldozer, in some cases it's, you know, it's a tent, whatever the case may be. Not everybody can do that. But what we can do is when the question comes before us as to whether something is pono or not, we need to critically think, does this oppress people? Does this break Kanavai Malahoi? And if the answer is, yes, it does, it is breaking Kanavai Malahoi, then therefore it is not Pono, and therefore we need to say, ah, ole. Ah, ole. So I say, ah, ole to this plan. Ah, ole loa. Ah, ole. So mahalo, and I will return the microphone to our... <laughs> And mahalo, Oren, for all the work you've done. And, and Baron, who has been uh, doing culture here for a long time. So mahalo. Hello, Taco. Um, just one more. Okay. Hello? Okay, just one more issue, okay? All of this is part of the gentrification of this place, okay? It's part of turning Kaka'ako into a tourist place, a place for rich people. You get million dollar condominiums, all of Kaka'ako. And this place, yeah, is part of our plan. They want to turn this whole area into a tourist area. And that's what they really want to do. They want to push us out. And they want to turn this into part of this whole gentrified area for, for the well-heeled tourists. You know, part of the discussion about what they want to do here, they said um, they want to turn this into a world-class park. World-class. Destination. Like, Destination. What is the world gonna do with Thomas Square? I mean, you know, you want all these rich people to come over here and look all these wonderful features they're gonna build over here. And they have all this kind of wonderful stuff. Concessions, uh, pathways, uh, water features all over the place. 
Where does that put us? Where does that put the nature of Namaste? Do we really want to sell this place out to development so that the well healed can come here and displace us? And that's one of the problems that I have with the plans for Thomas Square. Mahalo, Baron. Always. Uh, and now uh, we wanted to, this is the main reason why we had this, uh, to uh, hear from the Lahui and have an uh, open discussion about what you think. Because uh, we've really studied this and we're just offering this info to you. So here is uh, uh, David Malinex. Uh, uh, just that uh, everyone should know that you hear from, oh sorry, you hear from the media and from the city and county. Hello? Okay. But the homeless people are from the mainland, they're drug addicts, they're alcoholics, they're lazy. This is completely not who the homeless are in Hawaii. 70% of the homeless work, 50% are Native Hawaiian, 95% are from here. The number one reason people are homeless in Hawaii is because we have the highest rents and the lowest wages. That's it in a nutshell. The city and county and the state are providing no affordable housing. It's their fault. They've created the problem and they're not fixing it. And so they could be charging these multi-billion dollar projects where they're putting up all these million dollar housing and they could force those guys to put in a certain amount of affordable housing. They're not. They could force them to like, if you're gonna do this, then you can have a several million dollars to help the homeless. They're not. They're not doing anything to help the people you know, just to get out of it. Nobody wants to be homeless. Every Sunday we're up here, rain, you know, people living in tents in a hard concrete. It is a miserable life to be homeless. It is no fun at all. So people say, oh, they're just lazy. Oh my God, no. <laughs> it is very, very hard. They go to work, you know, they're going to work. They have to take their kids to school. While they're gone, the city comes, steals all their stuff, everything, their tent, like Lalani said, their money, their food, the kids' school books, they'll come in the middle of the night and do this. Take everything, in a rainstorm, we've had a lady come over here, they did a rainstorm, they took everything she owned, nothing left. She was like, she had a thin dress on, completely soaked and freezing. So we gave her a hot cup of coffee, something to eat, gave her a towel, dried her off, you know, she felt better and then she walked off into the night. That happens over and over and over here again. It's, it's like non-stop, the city is vicious. It is like, it's inhuman what they're doing to people. And because they put out this whole thing, well, they're lazy, they're from the mainland, they're alcoholics, they don't care. They're you know impinging on us. Yeah, they've got nowhere else to go. And that's why they end up in the parks. There is nowhere else to go. There's no affordable housing. So that's all I wanted to say and just share that. Thank you, David, and thanks, thanks for all, all the, the you, you do food not bombs with us every week since 2012, or you know, so with Laulani, uh, everyone. Uh, so what I'd like to ask you guys: What else do you think uh, as this opening of discussion right now? What what do you what do you want to say? What, how do you think? Yeah. Okay, Kumea Law is taking down names. Uh, she's trying to uh, form a coalition, and that's exactly what we're hoping for. You know, um, so uh, can anybody have? Does anybody have any other thoughts or any other discussion? We'd like to get your. The taxpayers pay for the park, right? And these things were built and maintained. We getting that money back? No. I just want to point that out too, because some people have compassion, but they also have a lot of feeling for money. Both. It's not always mutually exclusive. And I think that people who will say, well, expense this, expense that, but I do care about people, it's good to point out that too. Every time they do that, you don't get a reduction in your taxes <laughs> at all. And all the money that was taken from you for it, you don't get it back. It's basically stealing from you. It's just something to think about. Yeah, excellent point. Yes, Joe. <laughs> I just want to say that a lot of the money that, uh, is, that comes from gener general excise tax, that goes into all the funding. So, just wanted to put that point that out. And, and, oh, my name is Sandal uh, I could see eventually people getting rid of unwanted buildings and then making parks in place of that so that people who actually have been breathing in the fresh air 
they actually like parks. It's, it's some people that like parks actually more than buildings. Aloha. First, I want to really mahalo Oren and Laulani for the organizing for the and their yeah, their Baron, whoever. I mean, Karen, Karen, I know I'm going to leave dog. people out, but I just want to thank you because um, this is a very important issue on so many levels. The place that I am going to concentrate on, um, and there are a group of us who want to do this. I think that. The houseless issue is extremely, extremely important, and it's it's very broad, as we all know, in the state. And that really, there's a lot of work that needs to be put behind that. Um, one of the things that we want to start to organize is the doing the research, the forming a coalition that will work together to um, so that we can be more articulate. We can write the letters, we can be at the hearings, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and we can, um, in a very methodical way, address the issue of protecting and preserving uh, Thomas Square because of the history here for us Hawaiians. Um, but it doesn't mean that the coalition is only made up of um, Hawaiians, you know, of Hawaiian nationals, of Hawaiian aboriginals. It, it is anybody who feels like this place is theirs too and they want to protect it and preserve it. Okay, so I would just want to make that clear because someone came up to me to ask, is this only for Hawaiians? So I want to just make that clear. If you're interested in doing the work, if you're interested in researching, if you have some skills in terms of writing, please come to see me so we can put you on this list and get some stuff going. Okay, thank you very much. Mahalo, mahalo, uh, So, uh, does, uh, are, there, are there any more thoughts on this? Because we'd like to hear, oh. Hi, thank you very much, Oren. And um, it's nice to hear that Kumu immediately got this uh, group together to do the writing, the researching, and the appearing at hearings. I also would like to remind us of what Lynette Cruz said yesterday, which is that we must not stay within the box of the oppression because they have a way of uh, controlling. They create that, that in the box process. And uh, for example, demanding an environmental impact statement, these things are all fine, but they never, never stop by themselves the developers' projects because the hearing is a shibai, just a sham. They hire their experts who want to be hired over and over again and therefore will find that their project is totally harmless. You can't get a bunch of experts to tell the city, no, this is harmful, and, and then that, ex that group to expect to an get another city contract, okay? So that's just how that works. So environmental impacts are generally written by a chosen few with great links to government or to the developer and they are very sure to write it in impossible to understand and rebut technicalese, right? And they make it very big and thick. And then they say, okay, you have a month to read this and show up at the hearing. Well, nobody can understand technicalese, believe me. And so that's all planned to keep people away from frustrating their capitalist, imperialist, exploitative goals. There's no other way to put it, okay? So my view is that going back to Lynette Cruz's call for outside the box thinking and action in addition to inside the box, meaning that, you know, we do some people go to the in the box things and they need to be educated too, but really what works ultimately is the political uprising of the people. And in that sense, I've been feeling that they, like Liko said, sometimes they're really stupid. I think it's really stupid of them to try and attack really the sacred emblem of Hawaiian Pono and Ea. I mean, that is as stupid as you can get. I mean, I can't see how that would not just motivate Hawaiians and, and people who admire your Ea and your Pono, like myself, yeah. to get involved 
in opposing this. I mean, and they are not. And here's another aspect of the stupidity. They're doing it smack in the middle of a mayoral election. Okay, you know, go get Canwell on this. My former uh, law school yep. classmate. Get him and get the other mayoral yep. candidates and say, what is your position on this right now? Because they say that they are going to close off this park August 15, two weeks from now, right? And then, you know, you don't want signs of failure. You don't want signs that they're moving forward. You want to stop them dead cold, right? And it seems to me uh, that you raise this wonderful issue about the rights of people, what's porno for the homeless. Linking it up to the homeless is also fabulous. It brings a present crisis to the source of your pride, of your strength, of your inspiration to the world, the, business, the, the inspiration being porno and AR. You know, I have quoted that uh, statement in books I write, and people say, really, Hawaii has this, has this statement by Kamehameha the third? Yes, they do. And the world is in such a crisis, the entire world needs to obey that, that particular uh, statement of uh, Kamehameha the third. You know, it would be an example to the world. That's what we need right now. The whole world, Pono and Ea. So, a thought occurred to me yesterday, right? Why not have a massive sleep in with the homeless the weekend before August 15 and be here en masse, you know, when they try to evict? They're going to evict thousands of the homeless who have been sleeping together with everybody. That, I, I don't live here all the time now anymore, so I may be completely off in my remarks. But that's what would grab the attention, scare the shit out of the mayoral candidates, right? And I mean, and it would be a very potent symbol. And then back to the Sandy Beach issue, I mean, the, the, the genius of how to communicate the, ma the message on Safe Sandy Beach is sitting right here. She told you about it yesterday. So that's uh, Thank you. Let's, let's hear it for it. It's just amazing, Manalo, all around. Hi, I'm, my name is Kawila Sheldon, and I'm an out of box person. And like when I see water, I see girl. I saw some a tent that had some walla over there. You can just plant the walla right over there, right in the shade by the banyan tree. There's so much water over here. You can grow on loi, and that's food, and that's air, and that's pono for everybody over here that come over here. I like to thank Auntie um, Lo. Lawale and um and my brother over here for feeding the the houseless and for being here and um I want to try and be here too when you guys come out now. Can anybody else add? We still have some time before uh, uh, the next talk, which is on health. Uh, correct? Yeah. Um, so Doug wants to say something. Yes, Doug. Doug just recently wrote an article that blew up this whole issue. Hi, my name is H. Doug Matsuk. I wrote a little commentary in uh, um, Civil Feet. But I think some people are confused about the, the changes. About the changes. Uh, because, you know, they came to the community, the city, and they said, well, they're going to put in a statue and this flagpole and a bandstand improve it, clean it up. So I think they came, a lot of people were for it. A lot of the Hawaiian community were for it. They didn't tell them the details that in order to do this change, they have to convert it from a public park and transfer it to the Department of Enterprise Services and that it has to be financially self-sustaining, which means that there are concessions in here. And it means that the ordinances, the laws that govern, govern the use <coughs> of the park get thrown out because it's no longer a park. It gets covered under the rules, administrative rules of the uh, Department of Enterprise Services that they can make without any hearing, okay? They can make it on their own. They don't need your opinion. It doesn't go before the council or any other authoritative body. They make the decision as long as the mayor signs it, it's okay. So I think they did it in a, in a mayor, mayoral election because they wanted it as a good thing. They wanted, they thought people would be for it. So you have to remember 
that in order for this to come about, it's part of Mayor Caldwell's plan. And you know, if he's if you like it, you got to vote for it. And that's what they were hoping for, I think. But now I think the plan is exposed. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for that vital information. Always, there's eight points of what's going on. Uh, I was wondering, Mr. Palani Vaughn, would you like to say, say some words? I really wanted to just listen. <laughs> but, you know, it's the fact that uh, we are aware of what Testing. Oh, there we are. You think I know how to do this? Yeah. All those guys named Mike. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I happen to be um, in attendance when uh, Mayor Caldwell was talking about connecting this uh, or making a cultural walkway between Academy and, and also the NBC. I, I don't know why, uh, and I, I'm not sure, I'm still uninformed, but isn't the park under historic places yes, protection? Yes, yes. National Historic Register. Right, so wouldn't that trump any, not to use the... Uh, it should, that's why they're trying to Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if it's only if they take federal funds to do it. I didn't hear. What's that? If they take federal funds. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think also the British gap design. I did bring this up to Guy Club of Kukui, and I said this is a historic pass, and they're going to take out the pass. They don't have budget approved to put them back in. So they're just going to say, "Oh, give us more money, or else we won't give you the pass." I mean, this is. You know, I, I see this as um, just another overthrow of our Hawaiian identity and sovereignty. We have so little left, and it takes a, a mayor who is part of the A and B configuration, and I don't know. It's it's. I guess if we or can organize to uh, make some kind of uh, public statement as you guys are talking about. Uh, I'm happy to participate and help in any way. So, um, anybody got, has anybody gone to the uh, TV stations to talk about this? Well, we're going to gather over here and we'll talk more about it. But that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, I, okay. And if you organ, organize, uh, I can go to particular authority with the three uh, TV stations, KGNL, KGMB, and K5. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go talk with them. Okay, so she's uh, so she's Milani Yeah. So so let, let's let's hear it for everyone. Uh, 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 while, while we still have time, yeah. One just yeah. Uh, uh, committee form, please check into what this told you that there is no problem if they don't take federal money to develop this. Yeah. Don't ever yeah. take their word for it. You have fabulous Kanaka Maoli lawyers you know, who can, on your side, who can check that. That, just be skeptical every step of the way because they will tell you that, okay? <laughs> because if there is a federal law, let's our side read it, let's not have them read it to us, right? And if there is a federal law, you can immediately try to put in an injunction to get time to stop this. But I really feel that it has to be stopped. Some major action has to be done before the 15th, when if they continue with their plan, they would 
uh, start fencing this off or closing it according to Chuck's, uh, to Doug's article. Okay, that's all. Hello. How about this, guys? I remember walking down Waikiki and we did an Aina march. How about we do one on the 15th and let's just fill this place with Kanakas. Because that's what it's all about. <coughs> I'm tired of looking every which way we go. Down to the sea, down to the mountain. I look right. All you see is concrete. How much more concrete we're going to let them pour before we say enough? Because, you know, the rich guys, they don't care. They're going to make millions and millions of dollars of free land that they win steal. See, they don't care about us. We, as the people, got to stand for ourselves and not allow these guys to continue to do same old, same old every day. Mahalo. Okay, see there, see there are no, um, you know, no federal money. But you look at the history of Thomas Square. Somebody underneath in the guise of operating under the United States Constitution, okay? Like the guy who sailed in here and ordered the burning of all the flags. What happened when his boss find out? They went sail over here. I don't know what happened to the guy who went burn all the flags. But Thomas Square came. It's the same thing. I heard the word jurisdiction. Under the tax map key, the United States has no jurisdiction. They have no treaty. So if they have made it convenient for them to say there are no rules of protection, we don't come under Section 106 Historic Preservation Act, then what are you doing here? This is an absolute, it's a DNA to what happened in 1843. It's the same thing. Who needs to come here? The Commander-in-Chief. The Commander-in-Chief needs to come here. You know, a good friend of mine said, you know, bro, long time ago he said, I don't know when we're going to come. They know we're coming. And one day we're going to come. Sometimes we don't know when that time is. Sometimes we're not, we're not supposed to know. You only when we rise to that occasion and fill our hearts and have nowhere else to go. To, but to give up our life to be a patriot. Not just for us, a patriot for human dignity. So it's, it is every part a jurisdictional issue. Just like when I sleep in my car, I got a second ticket for sleeping in my human habitation. It doesn't even have my name on it. The cop throws it into my car and he says, you gotta go. So, you know, I got okay. So I look at the thing, so what did I do? I just shot from the hip. Took every piece of information and went straight to the tax map key. Keyed only with no determination of ownership. What does that really say? They don't have any annexation. They don't need to determine ownership. It's business as usual. Very legal, but very unlawful. Okay? So, what happened when the judge? I took him straight on the tax map key, straight to Geneva Convention, for the lack of uniformity with Geneva 4. The judge backed off. Dismissed with prejudice. So, I keep the thing in my car. So the cop comes up one other night. And I tell him, bro, I'm almost waiting for him to come. And I give him the paper. I say, oh, bro, I already won the case. He said, well, that was that ticket. It's not this one. The last ticket, when Nalani and I went up there, I mailed it from the United Nations to the director of whoever over here. They don't have jurisdiction, period. This is identified on the tax map key. We play it any way they want to play it. We don't want to get become political prisoners either. Okay, and that's exactly what you come when you're going to go into the court, you become a political prisoner. Okay, so anyway, jurisdiction. There's no jurisdiction here. This is Hawaiian Kingdom jurisdiction.
I think that's it. Once, once this... I, I that says it all. <laughs> so follow everybody for uh, participating in this. Uh, this is a great beginning and an honor to be beginning for being who you are. That's what it is when we face all this stuff, confusion, attacks, it's about being who you are and just saying it and living your philosophy. Is the uh, is act of a you know the true philosophy. So as Socrates said. So mahalo.